Good morning, good morning, Calvary Chapel family. It's so good to see you guys. Why don't we go ahead and let's stand this morning and let's pray. Let's give this time to the Lord as we kick off our Easter season, our, this Holy Week coming up, this Palm Sunday, as we remember those words, Hosanna, of the people expecting their Savior to come and seeing that prophecy fulfilled. Our Savior coming in. What an amazing, amazing feeling it must have been to witness that, to witness our Savior coming to save, to set the captives free. So this morning as we worship, as we sing those words, Hosanna, just picture that promise being fulfilled. So Lord, we come before you, Lord, we thank you that we get to worship you. We thank you that we live in the time that we live now where we know every single aspect of your salvation and how you came to save us, Lord. So we go before you this morning. We worship you. We thank you, Lord. We fix our eyes on you. Lord, give us strength this morning if we're lacking it. Lord, fix our hearts towards you. Lord, you do the work now as we sing scripture in a form of melody. Lord, we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's worship together.
in the Lord. Just lift up a song of thanksgiving in your heart. We have so much to be grateful for. But maybe there's something that we need to give to Him. So just take this time, just between you and the Lord. Let's take a couple minutes and let's greet one another. Say hi to someone new. Make them feel welcome. If you're new.
I get you guys to head back to your seats. Fellowship is over. All the introverts said, amen. All right. Well, welcome to Calvary Chapel, Fredericksburg. We're so glad you're with us. I'm Greg, I'm one of the elders. If you're with us online, welcome. If you're with us in person, it is great to see you. To give a quick uh, shout out to anybody that's here for the first time. You should have gotten one of these gift bags already. If you haven't, please look for somebody with the uh, hospitality name tag on and ask for one. It's got some gifts in there. It's got some information about the church. We want to make sure you understand, you know, who we are. And there's a card on the outside to let us know who you are and maybe tell us how you found us. And maybe if there's a prayer need that you have or something that we can connect you with the Lord or connect you with the body, we want to do that. Um, have a couple of announcements. Number one, VBS. So there's a VBS is coming, right? All right. And uh, we need some folks to help. So if you are interested in helping with VBS, there are signups available to get on the right list, on the email list, to know when the meetings and sessions are going to be to get ready for that incredible event. Uh, second, uh, there are men in this congregation who are signed up to go to the Meds Advance, and there are men in this congregation who are not signed up to go to the Men's Advance. So the second group needs to sign up because we need to lock down the number of spots that we've got so that we can have a full house to, to go down there. And there's some other churches that are kind of asking if they are open seats. And we want to make sure that we are open to that. But we also want to make sure you guys are taken care of. So please go online and sign up for that. Uh, remember, remember this Wednesday, there is no service. You can come, but it'll be locked. Probably won't be locked, but still. Uh, Friday service, Good Friday service, right? So be with us. So whatever you were going to do Friday, move it to Wednesday and then flip it and come Friday night. Okay. And then uh, also specifically want to thank folks that are, that are giving to Care Portal. So Care Portal is a way that we reach out to folks that are on the verge of having to put kids into foster care or are receiving kids into care. And so what this basically does is it allows us to, to meet a need, and it's kind of a really quick thing. It comes in, and within 24 hours, kind of you have to meet the need. And, and uh, we wanted to get praise from the ministry leader said, hey, uh, Barb Marr said, hey, we are really doing a great job knocking out of the park every time a care portal request comes in. Last thing we did was we provided diapers, wipes, and formula to be on standby at uh, Choices. So when people come in and they're worried about the cost of having a baby, we can take that worry away from them and say, there's, there's formula here for you, there's diapers here for you, and support that. So thank you for doing that. Uh, and then the QR code should pop in a second. That's anything else you want to take that QR code, that'll tell you what's coming up in the next few weeks. So if, take a minute and bow your heads. We will worship the Lord with our, with our offerings. Father God, we thank you for a chance to be here together. Lord, it is so good to be among brothers and sisters who love you. Lord, we thank you for the worship that we've experienced through song, Lord. We thank you for the worship that Mark is going to bring through your word. And we ask that you now allow us to worship with our giving. Lord, may you put it on our hearts, whatever you want us to give, Lord. May we be cheerful givers. And may every dollar go to what you want it to go to. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Calvary family, and Hosanna. My name is Vince, and here's what's happening at CC Fred this month. Gentlemen, registration is ongoing for the Spring Advanced Men's Retreat scheduled for April 12th through the 14th at Williamsburg Christian Retreat Center. Space is limited, don't miss out. Encompass will hold an interest meeting for those feeling called to step in and provide accommodations for our special need friends. Meeting will be Sunday, April 7th, following the second service in the Encompass room upstairs. All proceeds for To The Brim Coffee Bar will go to the Night Ski family, associates to the Arab world Eurasia. Grab a coffee and support missions today. On Palm Sunday, we will offer water baptism at both of our services. Are you ready to publicly declare Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Sign up to be baptized. Make plans to hang out after second service for our family potluck with games and activities for the kiddos. Good Friday service, a time of remembrance and reflection through the scripture and song at 7 p.m. Easter sunrise service, acoustic worship, and the reading of God's word in the field outside at 6.15 a.m. And then Easter Sunday services, modern worship and an applicable teaching at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. At CC Fred, we value serving. We desire to make disciples and equip them to serve where the Lord leads. If you've been attending for at least 
six months and would like to serve the body here, visit the Get Plugged In tab on our website. Thank you for joining us this morning. This was a highlight of some of the events happening here at CC Friend. For a complete list of all events or for details on what you've heard today, be sure to check out our upcoming events tab on our website or app. Now let's open our Bibles and silence our phones as we continue to worship the Lord through the teaching of His Word. All right, good morning, everyone. God bless you guys. Hey, let's turn to Luke chapter 19 in our Bibles. If you need a Bible, just raise your hand and we will lend you one. Looking at Luke 19 this morning, taking a break from 1 Peter and looking at Luke chapter 19. If you're there, say amen. amen. Say it like you mean it. No, I'm just kidding. Amen. 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 All right, that's enough. I always wanted to do that. See the things you do after 20 years? Today, we are going to commemorate, if I can use that word, what is known as Palm Sunday, right? Or more fittingly, the uh, Jesus triumphal entry. That is when Jesus makes his public entry into Jerusalem. Now, Jesus had come into Jerusalem many times. We even read when he was a, a, a young lad. And, and then, of course, we, we see it through his ministry going to and fro to Jerusalem but we ask ourselves, so what makes this any different? What, what, what is this Palm Sunday? What is this day that we're remembering so different than the other times that Jesus came in? Well, this visit that he came to, this, this was the proper time now for him to fulfill prophecy. And as you've heard other Bible studies on Palm Sunday, it was a time we finally accepted the people's praises. They finally accepted and allowed the people to praise him. Although we'll see in our study that it was an emotional uh, response because really their hearts, many of those hearts were not right. But nonetheless, this is when he allowed himself to, uh, to be, uh, you know, proclaimed king and Messiah. And he went by the script that was prophesied years, many years before this important event. And then it was important for him to allow this and to do this because it would be, if I could say, the beginning of the end of his first advent, his first coming, his ministry upon the earth. All has been said, all has been accomplished up to this point that needed to be accomplished. There was one more thing left. And this prophetic event launches what we call the Passion Week. After Christ comes into Jerusalem, it begins the timeline where it will lead him to Calvary. Well, we will see in this week coming the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Such a piv pivotal week, such a pivotal Sunday. And that's why we always want to bring a message on Palm Sunday or the triumphant entry of our Lord Jesus Christ. Looking at Luke chapter 19, picking it up, let's see, around verse 28, we read, when he had said this, that is the, the, the parables that he spoke on prior uh, to this, when he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And you know, every time you go to Jerusalem, it's always going up, even though he'll descend. It's always, that's a respectful way of saying we're going up to Jerusalem for the Jew. And it came to pass when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany, at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples. He sends them on an errand. And by the way, it's interesting how 
the Mount of Olive, all of it plays very important role in prophecy as well. For when he comes back, when he comes again in his second coming, that will play also a pivotal role, a place for his second coming. But here, this is his prepar preparation for going into Jerusalem. So he sends two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you where as you enter, you will find a coal tied on which no one has ever sat. That's an interesting uh, point there. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosening it? Thus you shall say to them, because the Lord has need of it. And so those who were sent went. And it's always good when God sent you to went. Okay, it's, or how, if God sends you, you should go. Okay, and they were being obedient. The Lord wants us to go, so we'll go. So they went their way and found it, what? Just as he said to them. Just as his word was spoken, it was there, it was true. But as they were loosening the coat, the owners of it said to them, Why are you loosening the coat? And they said, The Lord has need of it. Now, just a side note, isn't it interesting how God takes care of the other end? How we don't know how this, this owner of this coat realized that when they said the Lord needed it, they just let them go. Maybe God spoke to them in a dream. Maybe he, he confirmed it somehow prior to this. But whatever it is, when God sends you somewhere and tells you we're going to get to the other side, you're going to get to the other side. When he tells you this is the things that are going to take place, that thing, those things are going to take place. So just Bible study within the Bible study, just to encourage you this morning. So they went. The Lord has need of it. Then they brought him to Jesus, and they threw their own clothes on the colt. It was a makeshift saddle, okay? They, they wanted Jesus to be comfortable. And then they sat, they set Jesus on him. I could just, just picture that, okay, now Jesus, you know, here's this colt, right? Okay, this colt's like this big, and then, okay, Jesus, now come on, sit down, sit. Oh, that's, that's my colt, by the way, that would be Peter, you know, that's my colt, Peter. But anyway, sit down, you know, kind of deal, you know. There's Jesus, you know, he's, 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 he's lowly, he's on a colt of a donkey. And so, uh, verse 36, and as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. He was given the, the red carpet business, if you would. He was given the red carpet thing. John, the apostle John, and by the way, this is recorded in all four gospels, the, the triumphant entry, Palm Sunday. John writes, the crowd took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. Hence, Palm Sunday. That's why it is referred to that. But in this, in this, uh, in Luke's account, he says they, they, they put their, spread their clothes down out of respect, giving them that carpet treatment. Then, as he was now drawing near the, the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. And that would encourage the crowd as well to begin to sing a familiar psalm, very familiar to them. Notice verse 38. This is what they sang. This is what they said. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And here comes the critics. There's always a critic in the crowd. You know, you ever heard that? Here comes the critics. And it's what's sad is that these critics are the Pharisees. Who are the Pharisees? They were the religious folks. They were, they were the priests. They, they were the ones who have, should have been preparing these people for this day, as we'll see at the end of the message. They should have been preparing them. But instead, they're critics. And, and they called to him from the crowd. Teacher, they said, rebuke your disciples. But he answered to them and said, 
I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Now, let's be honest. Don't you wish they would have been quiet? (laughs) Don't you wish we would have had recorded here the first rock concert? (laughs) I mean, seriously, think about it. Christian rock. Christian rock. Okay, for those those you legalists out there. Christian rock. I'm just kidding. You know. But, um, I, you know, it would have been cool to hear what they had to say, you know. And so he tells them that. He says, the stones would immediately cry. That's how important this event was. This hinge pit. Uh, what do you call it? Hinge. Lynchpin. Whatever it is that it begins to open the prophecies to, to begin what, what, what they were waiting for all this time. All this time. Now, we call this message, we call this the prophecy of, of Palm Sunday, the Palm Sunday prophecies, because prophecy is so important for us it's so important. It's, it's all over the Bible. We read about it and we're intrigued with it many times when we read it and kind of ponder upon the things that were said and then the things that are fulfilled and the things that are yet to be fulfilled. And, and that's what encourages us, I think, is that to see things already haven't come into pass, have come to pass that was previously written and encourages us that the things that are left, the things that are yet to come to pass, gives us the assurance that they will come to pass. And it really encourages us in our walk with the Lord. One of those prophecies, of course, that speaks of this day and and the prophecies to come after is found in Daniel. So turn your Bibles to Daniel in chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. It's right after Ezekiel. You have the book of Ezekiel, then you have the book of Daniel, chapter 9. And if you can't find it, just go to the front and read the table. It's okay, read the table of contents and see what page. If you have the Holy Bible, it's on page 1014. (laughs) But, you know, you ever been in a church like that? Don't don't raise your hand. Uh, I did it for you. Now, as you're turning there, Daniel at this point is about 80 years old, okay? And he was reading here in verse 1, we find out that he's reading the scroll of Jeremiah, this, of another prophet. It's just so cool. Here's a prophet reading another prophet, right? And this prophet is writing down what he's experiencing as, as well. In Daniel chapter 9, let's look at verse 1 and 2. It says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, and the Medes were in charge at this time. This is the king, Darius. Well, there it says right there, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, Babylonians. And verse 2, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books, by the scrolls, by the scriptures, the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah, the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years. Now, circle that or underline it. And it's okay to write in your Bibles. And the desolation of Jerusalem. So at the time of Daniel's writing, Israel had been in Babylon for 67 years. This was ordained, this this, uh, captivity, it was ordained by God for them not obeying his command really early. (laughs) Really early when they were, uh, had come out of Egypt. The command was this, when I bring you into the land, and you know those verses there in the early parts of Genesis, you are to allow the land, and I'm paraphrasing, to lie 
uh, unplowed. To lie unplowed. I think the word is used fallow. Or just to lie unplowed. Every seventh year of your life. Every seventh year you are not to plow, plant, not to go out and harvest. Just allow it to rest for a year. And, and, and you will learn that I will provide for you. They, they had to learn that. They had to learn that, that the, the, the land was not to be plowed, wasn't to be worked. They were to take a year off and allow the Lord to provide for them. And there was other reasons. I'll let you look that up later. But they disobeyed that. And you know how long they disobeyed that for? 490 years. Now, do you tell me God is not a patient God. He's a patient God. But at the time that we come to here, they owed God 70, 70 Sabbath years. They, 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 they owed God 70 years. So what God did was he allowed Babylon to overthrow them and to bring them captive back to Babylon. Now Daniel realized Israel's judgment of these 70 years was about to end. And he says there, he picks up the scroll of Jeremiah. And where he's reading that is Jeremiah 20. Visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place, and that's speaking of Jerusalem, to bring you back. After 70 years, I will return. You will return to this place. So verses 3 through 19, Daniel begins to pray. And he begins to intercede for Israel. And he begins to seek the Lord's mercy. And he's worried a bit because they've been in captivity for these many years and he's realizing that by word, somehow by message, by word, that the city, the holy city of Jerusalem had been reduced to rubble. The temple had been toppled. And the wall, the surrounding, that surrounds the temple, that surrounds the city was in ruin. Now, if you were with us a few years ago, we studied Ezra and Nehemiah and we studied those and how, how interesting they correspond to what we're speaking of now. They had the duty to go back and restore it and, you know, get things in order there and the temple and the wall and so on. So as Daniel is, is praying through those uh, 16 verses... We read in Daniel 9.20 that while, uh, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, look at verse 21, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, and you can read that later, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. You see, at this time, Gabriel, who is God's messenger, comes to him, sent by God with a prophetic vision for Daniel. And God will inform Daniel through um, Gabriel that Jerusalem will be restored, but a greater restoration, a, a further prophecy who will be established by this vision for Israel. And that is of the restoration of man's soul back to God. The restoration of man. Not so much the wall and the temple and those things will be restored. But more importantly, the farther prophecy will be the restoration of man's soul. God will send his son, Jesus into Jerusalem, claiming and accepting himself to be their king and Messiah. Now, in Daniel 9, verses 24 and 25, 
Gabriel gives to him the prophecy which speaks of the exact day Messiah the Prince will enter Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Let's read it, verse 24. Seventy weeks were determined for, the, for your people and for your holy city. What is the holy city? Jerusalem. To, number one, to finish the transgression. Number two, to make an end of sins. Number three, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. To seal up, that means fulfillment and finish the vision and prophecy. And to anoint the most holy. And that is reference to the temple. All of this will be fulfilled in full at the 70th week in the 70th week prophecy to include the enthronement of Jesus beginning the millennial period. Now the word weak, this is very important, the word weak that Gabriel uses here in the Hebrew is the word seven. In context, he is speaking of a period of sevens. Seventy sets of sevens to be exact. Seventy sets 70 sets of seven years or 490 years he's speaking of. Now to speak of week of years in the Old Testament times was common. We use the word decade for what? 10 years, that's right. They used the word week for seven years when the context, and that's so important, right? Context, con when the context calls for it. And it calls for it here. Because what happened in 490 days from this? Nothing. <laughs> it had to be weeks of years. Gabriel gave details of how these 70 sets of seven are going to be fulfilled, how they're going to fit in to God's only son coming into the world and fulfilling, and fulfilling this prophecy. Look at verse 25. He says, know there, this is the details, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. Now, where do we get that? Where was that accomplished who and who and who who was given that authority to go and build that wall nehemiah that's right nehemiah the command to restore and rebuild jerusalem was authorized as scholars tell us when artaxerxes gave nehemiah the permission to go to jerusalem and restore that wall and their calculation it was on March 14th, 445 BC. They take the historical accounts of when this, he, this king was there, this, this, this authoritative person, Artaxerxes, was, was king, and they take it there and so on and so forth, and they came up with a date, March 14th, 445 BC. Now, it goes on and says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. This is speaking, please listen. This is speaking of the appearance of Jesus and his triumphant entry into Jerusalem of what we just read in Luke, Palm Sunday. From March 14, 445 BC until Messiah the Prince. There's a period there that is being fulfilled in our reading of Luke. He says there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Seven plus 62 is 69. Thank you. The streets shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. Well, when you read the Gospels and you read our Luke's passage, you see the temples there. The wall is built. Everything is done there. But he says... There that he calculates the 69 weeks of years uh, using, of course, the Babylonian calendar. And it comes up to 173,880 days. I thought you just wanted to know that. 
Now, beginning at March 14th, 445 BC, and counting off 173,880 days, we come to April 6, 32 AD, which biblical scholars tell us, like Sir Robert Anderson, last, last uh, first service I said Sir Walter Raleigh. I, was, I wanted to smoke, but you know, it's, uh, I curse Sir Walter Raleigh. But anyway, Sir Robert Anderson in his book, The Coming Priest, which by the way, you can go on Blue Letter Bible now. They put that up there. At least they put the calculations on where he got these dates from. And this guy did a lot of work. He used to work for the uh, the, the uh, London Yard. What's that? Scotland Yard. He was uh, an investigator. And when he retired, he dug into the Word of God and he came up with, with these dates. And it was the exact date, the exact day of our Lord's entry into Jerusalem. But you may say, well, there's, there's a seventh week missing because... God said there were 70 weeks determined. Well, that's true. Look at Daniel 9, 26, Alpha. Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. He says, after the 62 weeks, which is reference to the 69 weeks, after this, after Christ comes in, riding on a donkey into Jerusalem, it says what? Messiah shall be what? Cut off, but not for himself. What's that speak of? Crucifixion, his death. And then, and then there's a, uh, a comma. A comma that you and I have been living through in the last 2,000 years. See, when this 70th year begins, when God claims it and says, okay, now's the time, because he holds he holds the command for the rapture to come. Only he knows the day or the hour when that will take place. I mean, we've been waiting for that 70th week for a long time. And we wish it would happen today. You see, we've done two funerals this week. And it's so difficult sometimes to see loved ones and, and members of our church to cry and to weep and to have that distant look, you know. Although it's, it's not a look without hope because their loved ones are with the Lord. But it's still difficult to say goodbye to a loved one. It's still difficult to bury a loved one, amen? Even though they're believers, it's still hard. But we're looking for that day when we no longer have to weep with those who weep, that we can all just rejoice in one swell swoop at the, at the trumpet sound. We're gathered together and just worshiping the Lord. Amen? Well, you guys sound so excited about that. So I don't, I don't know, Mark. I just bought a car. You know, I want to kind of drive it a little bit, you know. I get that, man. You know, but anyway. But Gabriel is speaking of the death of Jesus on the cross when he says he was cut off. This is what that 70th, and we're waiting for that 70th week. But we're, we're interested in the 69 weeks, the, the accomplishment of those 69 weeks, the, 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 the accomplishment of those 173,880 days, the, the accomplishment of these years that are to come. And that's why we look at Palm Sunday. Now, another prophecy is interesting that has been fulfilled was the prophecy of Zechariah. In Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, he focuses on the approaching humble king and savior, as we read. And uh, truly, if the religious leaders of that time would have taken heed to Daniel 9 and studied it and taught it to the people, they would have been prepared they would not have missed their Messiah of whom they had been looking for. Zechariah 9.9 9 again says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just, he is righteous, and having salvation. Lowly, that's humble, peaceful. It's a, it's, it's a trait 
for a, a, a king who has victory, who has who has won, and riding on a donkey, a colt, the fowl of a donkey. Now we read that in Luke, and that was predicted five hundred years earlier before Jesus rode into Jerusalem. On a donkey, colt, the fowl of a donkey. Well, yeah, when a king came in peace, he would ride on a donkey instead of a, on a war stallion. He's going to come back again. We can trust that because of the 69 weeks being fulfilled. We know that 70 week is coming. And when he does come after the tribulation period, that seven year period, after the rapture, you have seven years of tribulation. In the end of that seven year, he's coming back. And he ain't riding no donkey. He ain't ri he's riding a stallion. And he's got a tattoo on his side. So anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, parents. Oh, the youth aren't here. Don't worry about it. But, uh, but as we read in Luke and the other gospel accounts, we come to understand this prophecy, as I said, was the script that Jesus followed on Palm Sunday before his crucifixion. We want to look at one more prophecy, and that's the psalmist prophecy. You know, here in America, we have what's known as the presidential anthem. We call it Hail to the Chief. And it's usually played to announce the president's arrival at a public ceremonies. It was played on March 14th for the first time. Uh, you know what president it was? So you guys don't know. I'm going to give you something you don't know. President Martin Van Buren's inauguration. So you write that down so you can test your kids or whatever. Also, Israel had its royal anthem. And it was taken from Psalm, from Psalm 118. And it was, it was written to announce the arrival of her king as he would approach Jerusalem. And they waited for that. And yet they would sing it every Passover. They would sing it as a processional song when they would come to Jerusalem, the songs of ascent, the Psalms of ascent, I should say, always with a hope that one day they would see their king come. But that one day came. It's Psalm 118, verse 24. Look at it. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray. Send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. And they would sing that year after year after year. And waiting for their king to come. Waiting for the one king who would come in the name of the Lord. But sadly, they were just caught up in the moment. Later that week, and you've heard this study before, later that week, the crowds will shout that Caesar is their what? Is their king. That's a direct stab in the back. That's a, that is a blasphemous thing to say. But Jesus said, God, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And that included the Romans who put them on the cross and, the, and his own folks who brought them to Calvary. So back to Luke as we close it up, prepare for baptism. Back to Luke, please, chapter 19. Let's look at verse 41. After the Pharisees, the priests, the religious sect told Jesus to rebuke his disciples, tell them to keep silent, Tell him not to sing that psalm, calling him king, calling him savior, calling him Lord. He does this. Look at verse 41. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and he, he wept over it. That word for wept, it, it's a deep, deep cry. He, he wailed. He, he saw more of the future of what was going to take place. 
And because they are, he knew their hearts and he knew what was ahead of him and what was coming to this holy land, this holy city in AD 70, they would not be able to have comfort in knowing that the one that came is the one they rejected. And he weeps and he cries over it saying this, if you had known, if you have been taught, if the Pharisees did their job, if the priests would have taught you and prepared you, if you would have known, even you especially in this your day, this is the day. This is the day that the Lord had made and it finally came and they missed it. The things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Prophecy really out of Isaiah as well. And he wept, he cried over them. He was so moved by, by these folks who were crying out this psalm, but really their hearts were far away from him. If you would have known even this day, a prophecy that was being fulfilled. It was this day the Lord had made, the day he picked in fulfilling Daniel's 69-week prophecy, awaiting the 70th week. It was this day that the Lord spoke to fulfill Zechariah's prophecy. It was this day that the Lord chose when the psalmist wrote those words to finally be sung in fulfillment of it. This was their day. And Jesus said, very sadly, that they, but now, they are hidden from your eyes. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2, Peter, uh, uh, Paul writes this, we then, as workers together with him, with Christ, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says this, in an acceptable time, I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Today, this day, this Sunday is the day of salvation if you haven't already embraced Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. So, Father, we thank you, God, for this time in your word. And Lord, we thank you that we're living in a day of grace where we can allow you to enter into our heart, God. That the weeping will no longer be for us in our sinful state, that we can ask you to come into our life, that we can ask you to cleanse us from all the sin that we ever committed, that we can ask you, God, to come in and have a relationship with us. And we know, God, the Bible says that you'll give the Holy Spirit to us and he'll come and live within us to just seal that relationship and to be with us until we go home with you and we see you face to face. And if you're here today, you never made that commitment to Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about a religious thing. I'm not talking about a membership in a church. I'm not, I'm not talking about, hey, man, I got to go and get clean first and then come back. No, he takes us just the way we are because he cleanses us. <laughs> he makes us right. No launder of soap can make us clean as, 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 with anything than that Christ can do for us. If you're here today, this is the day of salvation. We're not promised tomorrow. We're not promised tomorrow. And if tomorrow comes, friend, listen, that's God's continual grace because he's calling you to him today. And what do you do? We're right in your chair. You just cry out to the Lord between you and him and just say Lord I need you I'm a sinner I'm lost God I play a good game I put on a face but 
you know who I am, Lord. Clean me, wash me, save me today, God. Some of you may be saying, God, I've come back to you. I've walked away. I backslid, God. But I'm back here today to embrace that salvation again, to get back that joy that I so longed for. You just cry out to the Lord. And the Bible says if you call upon him, that you will be saved. He hears that prayer of repentance coming from your heart, and he will save you. Amen? If you prayed that prayer, we want to give you a Bible. It's called the New Believer's Bible. It's also called the Once Backslider, Now Back with Christ Bible. We want to give you this. You know, don't be ashamed to come up and ask for that. And well, people are going to know. Christ is the one. He, he's the one audience I preach to. He's the one person I live for. And if anything can spill over to you guys, praise the Lord. We come up and get one of these. And then if you want more prayer, we want to pray for you. It's interesting. We have the, the pools of baptism here. And the Bible clearly says in Mark, I believe it's in Mark, to be saved and then to be. So if you did pray that prayer today and you did receive Christ, what's going to keep you from being baptized? That's the next, the next obedient step is baptism. You say, well, hey, pastor, I didn't bring any clothes. Guess what? We just so happened to went to Kmart or Walmart and bought some sweats and we're going to take care of you, man. We already got those. We got all that taken care of. So you pray. I'm going to go change, and you pray. The waters of baptism here, the heart of obedience should be in your, you should obey. You should obey Christ. Amen? I'll see you in a minute. Let's go ahead and stand. Do you feel the world is broken? the shadows deepen we do do you know that all the dark will stop the light from getting through we do do you wish that you could see it all maybe we do it's all created a new creation coming it is it's the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst it is is it good that we remind ourselves of this it is is anyone worthy
with him. First. There we go. First up today is Emily Swearens. Hi everyone, my name is Emily. Thank you all for allowing me to share my beautiful journey with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Sunday mornings as a young child for me was an early service at my grandfather's Methodist church and summer weeks consisted of vacation Bible school with my sister and brother. We were all raised to walk with the Lord and learn the lessons taught by our, our, our almighty God. As I got older, I practiced sinful ways with friends for years, and then my grandfather's health had also declined. It was a very difficult time for me to navigate, and as a result, I strayed away from God. However, that did not last too long because I met the love of my life, Elias, and father to our beautiful little girl, Everly. My plans before Elias were already made up in my mind. I was moving out of state and changing my life around because at the root of everything, I was just so lost. Then. When I thought I had it all figured out, God showed me he was in control of both Elias and my journey. When we both needed God the most, and also each other, he made it happen. I know wholeheartedly that this was all a part of his plan for me, and these two loving humans brought me back to him. Jeremiah 29:11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. God has such a wonderful way of showing us what his plan is for you in life, and I am beyond grateful for everything he has given me and taught me. There was also a time I remember reading John 15, 13, greater love has no, no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. This verse really resonated with me due to the simple fact that Jesus' death on the cross was the ultimate act of love, and it was for me. This verse has always stuck out to me, and I honestly wouldn't be here without it. But I stand here today ready to be baptized in order to express my belief in Jesus and declare my overwhelming love for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you everyone for listening and being here. Next baptisms are a family, and so there's one testimony that will cover all of them. But first is Lauren Tyler. After the tragic loss of our son and brother a few years ago, we traveled a long and desolate road looking for answers to how and why these things happen and why us. One day a co-worker shared the story of Job, and after reading the book of Job, it provided me and us with the answers to all of our questions. We've been studying the Word at home a few times a week and started attending here at Calvary Chapel a month, a couple months ago. So today, the 24th of March, 2024, we the Tylers have decided to turn our lives over to Christ and to vow to walk faithfully with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lauren Tyler. Next is Colleen Tyler. Kira's next, okay. Next is Kira Tyler. Tyler. scheduled baptisms we have but if the Lord is working on your heart 
If the Lord is saying to you, you love me and you know me and you've not been baptized, then it's time to get up and get out of your seat and come forward. We've got clothes, we've got towels, we've got it all taken care of. So if you're struggling internally with the Lord on this, just stop struggling. Come on up. Is there anyone else? We had a bold ten. Come on up. Amen. Antonio Martinez Lee. Lila Cruz.
Dad's getting in to help out. All right, this is Kenzie Falk.
God bless you guys. A couple of announcements. There's Be a Barbecue right here. We're having our Easter barbecue picnic, potluck, so please. Thank you so much for joining us at Calvary at Home. We hope that you are blessed by today's teaching and by the worship. We want you to know that if you said yes to Jesus, if you responded to the gospel and put your faith in Jesus, we would love to send you one of these Start Bibles. It's a great Bible as you start on your journey with Jesus. It has a lot of great answers to some of the big questions about Christianity and about our walk with, with the Lord. And so if, if that's you, if you said yes to Jesus, be sure to contact us or to reach out to us. You can message us on Instagram, you can send us a message on Facebook. You can even email us at admin at ccfred.org. Please like and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and also subscribe to YouTube to make sure you're up to date with what's going on here at CC Fred. And we would love for you to join us as a church. We meet on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. and on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Well, we hope you have a blessed week in the name of Jesus, and we'll see you next time. Calvary at home.